started. So this is going to be a very, very quick chat as we move through. What we're going to discuss over the next six minutes or so is the development of guidelines supporting massive hemorrhage care in pre-hospital setting in Ireland. So if your ambulance looks like this, you may have met one of these, or maybe one of these, all right, and that's never good. But the reality is, each one of us has a significant role to play in the care of any patient who is bleeding. Whether you're the first person supporting your friend or colleague who's just slipped their arm open with a beer bottle, whether you're a first responder, whether you're a tactical EMS, whether you're an AP or, or a paramedic on the side of the road, whether you're Jason Landau in West Cork as a pre-hospital physician, or whether you're the receiving ED, I think the most important thing is first do no harm, okay? When we are trying to devise protocols internationally surrounding major hemorrhage, I think the big thing as well that we need to remember is that pre-hospital guidelines continue to influence education as we go forward. As a practitioner training, and when you're starting off, you essentially get a CPG book, don't you? We all have them, and we all use them from an educational point of view. And the savvy ones amongst you will look at your CPG and you'll say, where did they actually devise that? How did they devise that? Where did the thought process come from? How did I get to this point? All right? So when we're building these things, we must ensure that they're evidence-based. They should uh, maintain the principles of what we're going to be talking about, damage control resuscitation. We should be looking at always maintaining uh, homeostasis, avoiding clot disruption. We should be prom promoting clot formation, managing patient temperature, appropriately packaging and transporting the patient, and appropriately pre-alerting. Now that's a big guideline, isn't it? That's one, one page. But these are the principles that should be surrounding them. But do the simple stuff right. Always keep it simple. When we talk about simple stuff, really what we're talking about is the likes of hemostatic agents and tourniquets. And the reality is we can all get bogged down in the whole debate around what clinical level should I be at before I am allowed to apply a tourniquet. The reality is Boston bombings, all right, if you're a civilian on the side of the road and you whip off your belt and it saves someone's life, you just apply the tourniquet, okay? The reality is the patient doesn't care what clinical level you're in. Do the good things, the simple things right first time. When we talk about damage control resuscitation, I got Mark Forrest here with us in the room, so I'm not going to lecture you guys about this, but DCR basically is a treatment strategy that targets all the conditions that exacerbate hemorrhage in trauma patients. Coined in the World War in relation to them salvaging their ships and getting their ships back to base, it in essence uh, is the guiding light for us in relation to major hemorrhage management and trauma care. We also need to educate our staff in relation to trauma-induced coagulopathy. We, even as advanced paramedics, we're out on the road, a lot of the time we don't discuss this a lot, but the, the reality is it's there, it's present. It's actually present more than we know in a significant amount of patients who arrive in the ED with hemorrhage, and a significant number of those do have trauma-induced coagulopathies. This is part of the lethal triad, coined over 10 years ago now by Kareem Brody. All right. So what we need to do is we need to find early predictors of trauma and trauma-induced coagulopathy in patients and start using them. We need to use the likes of the TASH scoring system and the ETS systems so that we can recognize these patients early and we can pre-alert receiving facilities. Even in patients who have relatively low to moderate ISS scores, if they have an associated coagulopathy, their mortality goes absolutely through the roof. Keep calm, maintain homeostasis. Nice and chill. Okay? When we talked to Kofi chatting earlier about um, the effects of diluting your patient, this again we're doing. We're doing this all the time now. We're talking about permissive hypertension. Keep the blood pressure low enough to avoid exanguination while maintaining end perfusion of your end organ, unless you've got a massive head injury where you need to bolster it up a little bit. First clot is always the best. We want to keep that clot, okay? We want to avoid clot disruption. Go back even 10 years ago, they were talking about patients who did better if you just scooped and ran to the ED, okay? This was probably because we were pumping these guys with fluid early on, okay? And that's probably the reason why. So, what's the next evolution for us in the pre-hospital setting in Ireland in relation to major hemorrhage management? Probably this drug, tranexamic acid, I'm not going to spend six or seven minutes talking about it, uh, but the CRASH-2 trials and the evidence that's come out for military use is basically, you know, quite comprehensive, so it is. And I think what they've done really well here is they've actually pitched it and they have actually um, sold it very, very well. So let's just see if this works. Systolic 100. Systolic 9. Getting blood. Oh, 
stabilizer given within three hours of injury reduces the risk of bleeding to death by 30%. Check out the Crash 2 trial. <sighs> so, when you see drugs being sold to you on YouTube like that, you're kind of, oh gosh, it must be pretty good, you know? But it's all about advertising, isn't it? But they, in fairness, the Crash 2 trials also highlights some of the evidence suggesting that they have further work to do. So we see now the patch study being carried out in, the, in Australia, which is going to lead us to investigating those kind of uh, patients who are in, a, in, a, in um, other studies. So, as we move on here, oh my god, there's only 30 seconds left. All right, um, clot protection and gentle patient handling. When we see this we on, and this, we automatically think about what Darren was talking about, this. We should be applying one of these, but we should also be making the decision to decide which one of those am I going to use, all right? And all this process needs to take place right at the outset, the first few seconds. We want to avoid hypothermia. We want to keep our patients warm, comfortable, and cozy as we're treating them on the side of the road. Yes, I want to expose them, I want to see what's going on, but then I need to cover them back up again, all right? Patients don't do well if they get cold. They do not clot well if they're cold. When we're packaging our patients, we can wrap them in bubble wrap now, we can use vacuum mattresses. When we're transporting them, we want to do it smoothly. And when we do it smoothly, we might want to do it via heli. When we actually get or going to the ED, we need to pre-alert them to let them know we're coming. What do we want to pre-alert them to? Not just activation of their trauma team, but also activation of their massive transfusion protocols if they have them in situ. When we're doing our handover, your handover needs to be comprehensive. But it should also be considering oral anticoagulant status of the patient. All right? Sometimes, and you know, it's not something we think of all the time, but is my patient on Pradaxa or Warfarin? That might lead your ED physician down a different whole rabbit hole of actually getting the patient to require hemodialysis to get the Pradaxa out of their system. So we need to notify them of this area. So, to finish up, when we're building guidelines, the guidelines need to be robust, they need to be comprehensive, and they do need to cover as many aspects of the patient as possible. We cannot build a guideline around one drug or one treatment regime. Thank you very much. Thank you.